So what we do in post-processing the numerical weather predictions for renewable energy is um, not so far away from what you've saw, seen in one of the talks of the colleague from the Finnish Meteorological Institute. So basically the post-processing itself um, does not differ a lot, but we do have some more special needs regarding the temporal frequency of the forecast, the forecast horizons, the granularity of the forecast. Um, do we have to go for the spatial forecast? How high, high has the spatial resolution to be? Um, and it's more challenging than our normal post-processing of numerical weather predictions due to the data availability of our targets. The data quality of the targets, um, the accessibility in operational terms. Um, so there are a lot of issues for renewable energy systems which need some extra treatment. And um, we have to be really, really accurate or as accurate as possible with our forecasts because there's a lot of money in renewable forecasting and in the prediction accuracy. Um, because all the, the TSOs rely, um, they do not only rely on one single forecast provider, they do have a lot of providers, as far as I know, at least 10 providers, and generate their own forecast as well. But the money lies um, in the fees they have to pay if they um, tell the grid provider, well, we're going to provide you tomorrow and the days ahead with um, this and that amount of megawatts of wind energy um, based on the meteorological forecast. And then the meteorological forecast is wrong. Then the providers um, feed not enough or too much energy into the grid and get penalties. And um, these penalties are quite high. And as far as I know, in Spain, they have next to the wind um, farm, a gas station in case they're not able to match the uh, energy production by the renewables, they are using the gas. So not really a green solution. So now you might see some pictures you have already seen in one of the presentations. So digitalization for us in meteorology, if you go back into the history and why we consider ourselves as big data um, field, it started already in the mid 19th century with the first collection of the, the weather reports. And since then, we've gathered a lot of observations using different tools. Here you see one of the four, uh, first forecast maps issued. And what we also see already in this map are wind direction predictions. The next big step was the numerical weather prediction, which was first successful in the 1950s using the ENIAC computer. Um, then we started with all the weather satellites, the radio sounds for upper air soundings. And in 1975, the ECMWF was founded, which basically pulls all European meteorological resources together and provides tons of uh, meteorological models, reanalysis data, observations, and so on. In the past um, well, two decades, Roughly speaking, aircraft measurements, GPS measurements, and microlinks are being used also for weather prediction. And now we start using um, crowdsourced measurements like NetAtmo. So the Norwegian colleagues are already using NetAtmo data for now casting. Um, and what is also sometimes, but I'm not sure if it's operationally used, are measurements of mobile phone batteries. 
the temperature and pressure status of a mobile phone. Um, quickly repeating numerical weather prediction models, how they work. Um, so we have this global model, which is fed by observation, all kinds of observations. Right now it is um, 11 kilometers, has a grid size of 11 kilometers. Then we have the local models, which go down to one 1.2 kilometer resolution. And we divide the atmosphere into small compartments where we um, calculate all the flux equations, often use parameterizations um, because we cannot numerically solve everything. Um, sorry. And um, for every compartment, you have at least 50 meteorological um, parameters and static parameters such as um, land use, surface roughness, and the surface roughness and land use are important parameters for wind energy uh, prediction. Also topography is very important. Soil moisture, soil texture is also really important. And then there are some other parameters as well. Um, so if you want to uh, use some data analysis of uh, some NWP models altogether, you have already um, the issue of using big data and how to analyze big data. And um, we are all now sort of migrating a lot of our codes uh, or programs to run on CPUs and GPUs and also some numerical weather prediction models run parts of the code on GPUs, like the Swiss Cosmo model, um, which is run in part on a GPU. So going to Austria, um, we have these tons of parameters in the horizontal and in the vertical. And um, for Austria, we have now operationally running a local model with 2.5 kilometers for the next 72 hours and with 1.2 kilometer resolution for the next 12 hours. And this high resolution model is run every hour for the next 12 hours. As you can imagine, we cannot save everything of this 1.2 kilometer model because we simply run into space issues. And also of this 2.5 kilometer model, after half a year, we only keep the important parameters and we remove the rest of the parameters. We simply don't have the storage that ECMWF has for keeping everything. So that's our solution. And here you see already how our models, the numerical models work or which domain they cover. So we have the, our Arum model, which covers the Alpine region. And we have this rapid update cycle model with the 1.2 kilometers, which covers nearly the whole Alpine region. This part in France is missing. Um, but the important thing is Austria is in the center of the domains. So we do not, uh, we hope that we do not have too much influence from our domain boundaries to our modeling domain. And the AROM model uses now operationally observations, radar data, satellite data, airplane data. And we have now a test running where we assimilate the observations of wind turbines into the model as well as net atmosphere observations. But this is right now a test. And we have for, specifically for wind parks, we have a parameterization included, which um, is kind of a basic parameterization. So you tell the model, here we have a wind farm. It has that amount of wind turbines. They are roughly 100 meters high. And um, that's it but it does consider that there is an obstacle or some obstacles in the flow field. What we also have, and this is also very important for 
basically every post processing and every weather prediction, um, we use ensembles. And starting with next year, we have next year then really fully operational and ensemble running for the Austria with 2.4 kilometer resolution, which also covers the greater Alpine area. This is run four times daily. It has 16 members and at zero UTC and 12 UTC, it's um, available for the next, I think 48 hours. And at six and 18 UTC, it's available for the next 12 hours. And this is also due to um, computational resources of running such an ensemble and also storage. And what we do is we take the model output and we clean already the model output even before we continue transferring it to our computers. So um, you might have seen something similar already where you have the grid of an NWP model and the point you want to um, predict. So what we see now in this um, figure is what the Arom model looks like for the one of the eastern parts of Austria, where we have quite a lot of wind energy. So you see this 2.4, 2.5 times 2.5 kilometer grid box. And you see here some wind farms located. Um, And what we also see is we, here we have 2.5 um, kilometers. If we would use the European model with 11 times 11 um, kilometer resolution, we would have all the wind farms, which we see now, at least separated into some grid boxes or nearly all in one grid box. Um, which means that for taking the relative forecast of an NWP model and using it for wind turbine, would not really work. You really get pretty smooth forecast of the behavior of the wind and wind is never really smooth. Um, so what we have here are the, these two points are wind um, two wind farms and you see already what can also be one of the issues when you model um, or want to predict for wind turbines and want to really predict for every wind turbine. So let's consider we have northwesterly wind speeds and the flow coming here directly from this nice Arom grid. Um, the first turbines would get most of the undisturbed wind if we consider that we have no obstacles here. So this, these turbines would really get a lot of wind if we want to call it like this. And in the back, we have already um, quite shielded wind speed and wind pro uh, reduced wind production. And what we also have here in those wind farms, wind turbines produce wakes. So this, they disturb the flow and produce little wakes similar to an airplane um, or flow over one of the, the wings of an airplane in the back of the airplane. So this is also something you have to consider when modeling a wind farm or a single wind turbine that you never really have undisturbed flow of the, the wind. Um, and what we do get from the Aru model is a forecast directly of the model at the typical nacelle heights of wind turbines at 800 and 135 meters above ground, um, which are basically interpolated um, wind speeds from the bottom layer and the next pressure layer or, or, or model layer of the um, NWP model. And um, what are the challenges we face when we want to predict for wind turbines? One challenge is the data availability. 
so data of wind turbines, the measurements which are directly on top of the turbine in one of the gondolas you have behind the rotor plates, you have the measurements of the wind speed, um, wind direction, temperature, um, sometimes pressure, and um, sometimes relative humidity. And what you also get is the power production of each turbine. Basically, that's most of what you can get. All the other parameters you seldom get. There are quite a lot of parameters in the SCADA data, but often you don't get them as a forecast provider. So with the knowledge that the measurement is already behind the rotor blades, you know that the quality of the measurement is not that good already. Then the online availability, which is right now for most of the wind parks we have access to delayed by 30 minutes. And it's only updated every 30 minutes. Um, the radar data we use in the models is time lagged by 10 minutes, which is quite OK. And um, we also use airplane data, and they, are, they need some additional pre-processing. So this is already some, a bit of challenge when you want to feed all those data into a model. The other problem is when you want to forecast for a wind turbine is that um, the own model right now takes roughly three and a half hours to finish one forecast for the next 60 to 72 hours. So when you want to produce a forecast at zero UTC, the one you have available, the latest home model run is the one at 18 UTC. There would be one model run between 18 and zero UTC, but that's a 21 UTC and not finished in time for the zero UTC forecast. So you often have a six hour time lag. The home rack model is um, finished faster, but here we have um, a bit the issue that the model is running since this year. So we do not have enough data for forecasting any post processing. And then what we always have is um, no matter which kind of data, which does not belong to Zank, is the data transfer and the data storage. So these are already a lot of, let's call them minor issues for wind power forecasting or solar power forecasting, but they do play into our forecast quality. So what do we want to do? We want to go from this classical NWP wind mill forecast to this high resolution tiny thing forecast of a modern wind turbine. Um, this image was taken in Spain, close to Pamplona, where they have quite a lot of wind energy um, farms and production. So we want to go from here to here. And we use post-processing. What else do we need to consider um, in post-processing uh, of an NWP model and observations? Well, normally our observations are here somewhere that normal meteorological observations uh, for wind at 10 meter height above ground. A wind turbine, the modern ones, have their nacelle height at at least 100 meters above ground. Uh, I think the latest or the newest turbine models aim at 200 meters above ground. Um, so we do have uh, this large deviation of the real of the wind profile and the increase of wind speed with height above ground. Uh, normally, the post-processing uh, method itself doesn't care what kind of data it gets. It produces something and um, 
expects the user to know what he's doing. And you can use 10 meter data and you can also use the data measured here on the gondola, in the back of the, the gondola. But you have to know what you're doing. So you cannot just take the things for as, as they are and, and use them. Um, so what we use right now are some really basic quality controls algorithm for the SCADA data itself. Um, then we use machine learning and statistics models for the intraday to day ahead forecast. We want, uh, are we still working on this gridded forecast? We work on the gust algorithm because wind turbines, what you get from, from the providers is the 10 meter wind and it's the average wind speed. A problem for um, wind turbines itself are the gusts. If the gust in this level is really high and we have high wind speeds in the gusts, they can be a problem for the wind turbines and the, especially the blades. Uh, also when it comes to turbulence. So you need to somehow estimate what the gustiness level would be. Um, we have some unsupervised data clustering methods. And um, you might guess it has to do with the nice picture I showed you with the grid boxes and the closed wind farms and um, they how you can cluster the data to improve your forecast. And what we also aim for is a deep learning precipitation prediction. So um, for the quality control right now, it's a, a simple algorithm based on some industry standards with some basic outlier detection methods included. So what we see here for some wind turbines is the annual uh, energy production curve plus the power curve, which was provided by the um, uh, manufacturer of the wind turbine. And this is this nice red line, what you see here. And when you try to calculate um, a power curve yourself, you have to clean to, to really get the real um, values that one turbine can produce, you have to clean the data from outliers. And what we see here with this turbine T52 is we have a lot of outliers in um, this production range of 4, watt, uh, 400 watts. Um, and this seems to be some sort of regulation from the outside. Um, to not have the turbine producing more than 400 watts um, for some specific dates. And this is what we call curtailment. So in case you wonder why we have this uh, curtailment in one turbine, but not for the other three, this specific turbine belongs to an Austrian company, but is not located in Austria. It's located in Hungary and Hungary has different rules for feeding energy into the grid. In Austria, so they have curtailment there and in Austria right now, we do not have curtailment. And curtailment means the grid operators um, are nice in the beginning, call you and tell you, hey, you're producing too much energy with the turbine, please regulate it or take it off the grid. Um, if you're the operator and you're not responding to this nice question, the grid operators shut you down from the outside or regulate your turbine so that it's only allowed to feed a certain amount of energy into the system. And this is done to regulate the system and to keep this 50 Hertz stability um, within the power grid. So before calculating anything, you have to get rid of the outliers. 
And then we decided as a basic quality control, it might not be the best, but right now it's the one we use. Uh, we add a range of how much the points of wind, the, the point pair of wind speed and power production is allowed to deviate from this annual energy production curve. If you're outside, this data point will not be used for the training of the model. Um, for production, if you're outside, the data point is um, kind of averaged between the neighboring wind turbines of the same wind farm. Or if all um, wind turbines have some problems, we simply use the prediction of our NWP model. So this is what we do for quality control in the wind energy sector. And um, right now it's work, it works, but I'm pretty sure there are smarter methods. Um, what we also did check before kind of starting with uh, any sorts of model is uh, look into the different in, uh, feature selection tools. Um, this was now done for gusts and um, for one of our normal observation sites and for a wind turbine. And we had a look what parameters are important, what do we want to use. Then we did use a different um, selection method, which came up with quite a different amount of parameters. And again, another version. And what I used was the lasso feature selection. Um, I used XGBoost and I used random forest feature selection. So it is not easy to select um, a set of features which work. And um, a colleague of mine is now using covariators and um, boosting and puts more than 3000 parameters and covariables into his boosting model, um, which also takes an amount of running for the code. So how do we, um, or what do we use for forecasting? We have different temporal horizons and frequencies for forecasting in meteorology. We have the now casting range, which is for the next, let's say, two to three hours ahead. And we have the medium range, which is for the next 48 to 72 hours. Generally speaking, in now casting, you also want to go beyond the um, hourly frequency and want to provide sub-hourly forecasts. Uh, for the medium range in metrology, you go to um, normal for um, one hourly forecasts. But in wind energy and in solar energy, they also want to have sub hourly forecasts for the next days ahead, which is not so easy. Um, first of all, NWP models do not provide sub hourly forecasts. Um, they provide hourly forecasts, but right now no sub hourly forecasts. So you have to come up with a clever interpolation scheme or, or, or another scheme on how to use NWP forecasts for intra hourly forecasts. Um, for the now casting range, we do not really have right now the issue of using a strategy for NWP data because in the now casting range, you seldom use NWP. Um, now cast, in now casting, the observations are important and the persistence. So what we have in now casting is right now we use only observations of the past um, time frame, and you can define um, 
you have to check what time frame is appropriate for your parameter. Uh, for temperature, it could be more than a day. For other parameters, it could be the last couple of hours. So this really varies depending on the parameter. Um, it might change in the future when the high resolution model is available, which provides forecasts every hour. Then we might also use for now casting an NWP model. So what we do in now casting is um, we use the observations. We did some feature selection beforehand. Um, and then we have uh, an ensemble of different methods, um, which we can use all in, at once, or we just select some of the best performing ones and use those as an ensemble. Right now we have uh, a multilinear regression, a support vector regression, random forest, XGBoost, a simple feed forward, a complex uh, neural network, which right now is not tuned and does not perform good. Uh, a Monte Carlo, a, a really basic Monte Carlo method, then some stochastic noise forecast, um, then the light GBM, gradient boosting, and a simple LSTM model, which is also not tuned that good, but it provides results which are quite OK. And um, this is our um, machine learning based now casting model. And depending on um, the temporal horizon frequency our input data has, so it's either five minutes or 10 or 15 minutes, we provide forecasts for the next three hours in the respective resolution. And um, I have, is there a question? Yes, there's one question. Uh, what are the problems you are facing with the complex neural networks? Is it overfitting? Um, yes, it is overfitting. Um, and the other problem is I simply have no time to tune it. That's one of the problems. So it's um, it would need quite a lot of time to, to properly fit it. And um, I decided to skip it because the other methods are performing quite okay. So when you think of um, using more or less the same amount of data for every method, then the complex network is not really performing well right now. Are you, the, the tuning is done by, by validation, I guess. Uh, well, I did use, for some methods, I did use grid search or random search. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the neural network, I gave up on grid search in the end because it was taking so long. Yeah. This was really, really a pain. Um, what I did tune was is the simple neural network where I, by validation, changed um, the, some of the hyperparameters. And um, I added some, added a dropout layer, um, Gaussian noise was introduced, and some uh, bias and activation regularizers. May, may I ask, do you use Keras in Python? I, I use Keras. Very good. Um, right now with the TensorFlow backend. Um, but we also have it running with the Theano backend. So I don't mind which backend is used as long as it works. Um, yeah, it's, it's all Keras or sklearn. Yeah, these are also the, the main packages we, we use in our courses, KikitLearn yeah. and uh, Keras. What I thought of, and I'm not sure if, if I have time, I thought of changing the random forest and using the R version of random forest as it's way faster than the version which is implemented in Python. But this is just a thought. 
Oh, yeah. Um, and I mentioned in one of the NWP slides that we try to provide an ensemble. We try to use ensembles in forecasting as the uncertainty estimation of a forecast uh, is very important. And the um, renewable energy sector is now really also using um, probabilistic forecasts. So they do not only rely on the deterministic forecast, but they, they want to have the uncertainty estimation. And for the now casting model, as I don't have an NWP model, what I did was stochastically perturbing the observations. So I'm generating a set of um, alternative observations which are stochastically perturbed using a Gaussian distribution. So this is what you see here in the, in the figure for the starting point. Um, the black line is the original observation and the thinner lines are the stochastically perturbed observations. And what we also have is for and this ensemble of methods plus for every method, um, another ensemble. So we could provide a, a multi ensemble of everything. Uh, the simple LSTM model was implemented in May and I implemented it on my notebook and it's running quite okay on, on my laptop, on the CPU, but it's a really, really basic LSTM with only one hidden layer and also not really that tuned, but it's performing quite okay. So, okay. Uh, so to give you some examples of what one of those um, gustiness forecasts for this now casting range would look like, I have only two methods here with uh, their uncertainty range. So what we see here is in black, uh, the observed gusts. Then in this blue line, we have this, what I call artificial gust, which, which was generated with an extra code based on the medium, uh, on the mean wind. And you have the Monte Carlo forecast and this noise based forecast. And this is for the next two hours, a forecast every 10 minutes. Um, the thick line always represents the ensemble mean plus the colored um, uncertainty range of the forecast. And what we see here is that the simple Monte Carlo method is not performing that bad. Um, also the noise forecast, but only for this specific case, it was quite okay. Um, if we move to a solar energy farm, so I have here some results of um, a solar power plant. I think this um, was the 15 minutes forecast. So depending on what you get from your solar energy provider or the host they are logging and storing the data, you can have a one minute solar energy production uh, frequency, five minutes, 10 or 15 minutes. And this really, really depends on what kind of platform they use. And here at SAMC we have um, three, um, solar panels, um, we have one facing to the east, we have one facing to the south, and we have one on our roof. And the one on the roof and fa the one facing to the east use the, I think, the power dog platform. And there we have a five minute resolution. And the one facing to the south is a new one. And there we have solar edge, I think. And there we have 15 minute resolution. So 
this is one of the things you can have within one point you can have a differently resolved observations plus some um, if you, they have no measurements for solar if there has no energy productions some platforms just provide you with a bunch of nuns and some platforms have no entry in the database at all for this um, time point so in solar energy there's a lot in, to in, um, invest already in data cleaning before you can even start working properly with the data and this is an example forecast for i think for the 15 minutes um, for a selected for, for another selected farm i think somewhere in upper austria so in the northern part of austria north of the alps and um, for different methods so we see here the xg boost which is an, and this i also have to admit that one is not really properly tuned and is never really issuing good forecasts uh, and then for the lstm the simple feed forward network and the random forest and what we can see here is that um, the lstm the simple feed forward and the random forest are quite similar in the forecast for that specific day. Um, same for another point in time of that day. And at 14 UTC, which is in March already whew, close to dawn, um, they are quite off all methods. And um, in solar energy, you have to take into account that there is no energy production during the night. And you have to um, sort the data based on dusk from dusk till dawn. Plus, uh, you have to add an additional parameter telling you um, based on the location and the topography when you can expect that the sun hits that specific point and uh, co uh, that coordinates. So for solar energy, you have to add also these um, informations to your model. And um, for this um, specific energy farm, I used, I think, three years of training data and had 2019 as my test year. So um, depending on what you get from the um, farm operators, you, if you're lucky, you get three years or even five years of data. In Austria, I have to admit, getting even five years of solar energy data is probably not going to happen. Uh, solar we don't have solar energy um, so long in Austria for, for that. Um, and I think real solar energy production started three years, four years ago, maybe. And um, so in contrast to wind energy, where you, if you're lucky, get 10 years of data, uh, we don't have that amount of observations data. And um, the next step for solar energy would be besides all this data cleaning and adding additional information to your data set, um, the feature engineering using boosting and co-variables, fine tuning of the methods, and then also tune the ensemble methods. So as I showed you right now, also for the observations ensemble, I'm using um, stochastically perturbed observations. And uh, what you see here, you should actually have um, an ensemble here. Uh, but this stochastically perturbation of input data and um, training to stochastically perturbed observations uh, did not really change anything in the model in, in the machine learning forecast. So you have no real ensemble spread as we've seen with the 
Monte Carlo method or with the noise generated method. Um, so the idea is using different seed factors to generate an ensemble which has a, a proper spread. Um, so this would be the next steps for the solar energy production. So right now also the solar energy is still work in progress. Um, and we hope that we have something working properly next year. Um, for wind, uh, now we're moving to the medium range forecast for the next 48 hours. Uh, we have this operational uh, artificial neural network, which is an ensemble of neural networks uh, where every uh, lead time into the future, so every target lead time has its own ensemble of forecasting um, neural networks and uh, is tuned specifically for this point in time in the future. And um, the good thing is we have access to this uh, SCADA data, but again, right now with this 30 minutes delay, the quality control is inbuilt and this model is quite flexible. So we can adjust the forecast intervals we can adjust the ruins, the numbers of layers. We can adjust the training length depending on the data availability. And um, we can also tell uh, the model how many, um, uh, what the interval around our target time has to be. So we can tell the model, I'm going to predict for um, forecast hour 12, but I also want to use data of forecast hour 10 to 14 to get rid of um, the time shift many NWP models have. Mm. So this is running, mm, let's say, semi-operational. We had to change the machines. And with this changing of the machines, we were migrating from Ubuntu 16 to Ubuntu 18, and from the Nix environment to the Conda environment. And now suddenly our forecasts take twice as long because the loading of the saved model and the weights takes 10 times as long as compared to the Nix environment. So we are bug fixing again and also saving it to the TensorFlow version. Uh, this TensorFlow model did not really change anything. So it's not running right now. And the challenges are that um, we have this 10 minutes observation with the 30 minute delay. Uh, we have the NWP data that goes into it. Right now we use one model, but we can also use an ensemble of NWP models additionally. So we are not limited to a specific NWP model, but they also have a delay. Um, and another problem which every post-processing method so far faces is that NWP models change more or less regularly every three to four years, you have major upgrades to an NWP model where you have changes in the horizontal and vertical resolution. You have changes in the model physics. So it's the issue is I have my pre-trained model for the old version of the NWP model. They changed the NWP model is my um, machine learning model still working properly? Do I have to wait for a couple of months before I can retrain the model with the new NWP model? Um, so this is one of the issues we have in post-processing. And the other issue spe um, is specifically for machine learning is these non-convection permitting models. So 
numerical weather prediction models use a resolution below four kilometers. Um, they ah sorry above four kilometers. They are easy to learn of. Uh, so it's okay if you use 120 days for training or maybe half a year. Um, that's quite okay. If you go to the convection permitting range where you start resolving also the topography, so where the Eden Valley in Austria becomes a valley and not a, a smooth hilly region, for those you need a lot of data to train your model because they, are, they have no, let's call it smooth forecasts. They are already able to reproduce the fluctuations you have in wind speed and wind forecasting. And the bias of the NWP model of the convection permitting is not so easy to learn compared to a non-convection permitting model. Helene, I just, yeah. just to give you a heads up, we have now five minutes to seven. Uh -huh. uh, it would be nice if we then could have some time for discussion. Yes. Um, then I have a nice example for you. So this is the non-Austrian wind turbine and the pre prediction for it. And um, what you see here in blue and in orange are the neural network and the random forest forecast for this wind turbine. And in uh, green, you have the ECMWF model with the 11 kilometer resolution. And this is one of the other problems we have in every statistical and machine learning method. Right now, we are not really able to reproduce such, um, let's call them peaks in wind or like here, uh, but they don't really see it. And even with uh, a another correction of the neural network, you're not able to get such intermediate peaks. So this is one of the issues also in uh, solar energy. And right now, what also often happens is that we have the nice blue line, which is more or less a medium. It performs well in terms of bias and RMSE, but the real forecast itself looks like a flat line. And the same happens for other methods as well. And um, this would be for clustering. And now I jump directly to the Jupyter notebook um, for this forecasting challenge. Um, there are from time to time forecasting challenges in the energy, uh, renewable energy sectors. So the, the well-known ones are all those Jeffcom 2012, 14 and 17 competitions for wind, uh, solar and power production. And the new one is the CNR 